I've been building a custom game engine for about five years now. It's about 20,000 lines of code, so I thought it'd be fun to go over the design and do a bit of code spelunking. I've checked the code out fresh from GitHub. I'm currently on my iMac, but Iris also supports Windows and Linux, with some basic support for iOS. It's already built, and I've set the startup project to the sample browser, so here we can see some simple examples which showcase animation and various rendering techniques. The code is broken down into various components. The first is core, which is a grab bag of classes and utilities uh, used throughout the engine. We've got maths classes like vector and quaternion, uh, random number utilities, and several concurrency primitives like thread and semaphore. One of the most important classes is root. This is a singleton class which provides access to the various managers of the engine. These managers, coupled with root, provide a convenient way for a user to create certain core primitives without having to worry about the platform. For example, a user can call root window manager and use that to create a window without having to worry about the platform specific implementation. If they take their code and compile it on Windows or Linux or Mac, it will look the same but will call down to the right implementation. So for logging, Iris has a basic custom logging framework. It provides various log levels as well as the ability to log variable number of elements. I'm not super happy with it in its current state. I'd like to refactor it to not use macros and use std format, which wasn't available when I originally wrote it. The graphics component is probably the most complex part of the engine, as it has to handle multiple platforms and graphics APIs, whilst hopefully providing a reasonably intuitive interface. To start with, we have Window, which is responsible for creating the platform-specific window, as well as handling input events. A window owns a renderer, which is responsible for rendering. The interface for renderer is very simple. You can call render or set a render pipeline. The render pipeline object is responsible for the logic and machinery of describing what you want to draw on the screen. It's where a lot of the magic happens. From the pipeline, you can create scenes and render graphs and render passes and all the things you need to build up your game. Once you've assembled all your scenes and passes, the pipeline takes all these and converts them into a series of render commands. These commands are render system agnostic and are a low-level building block for rendering. Any of the built-in renderers can take a series of commands and execute them. This is nice because I only have to write the logic once and it just works across all the graphics APIs. It also opens up the door to a lot of optimizations such as distance sorting and culling and I'd only have to implement all these once. So just looking through the implementation, we can see here that it takes all the user-defined passes and adds additional ones for shadows and ambient occlusion. It then adds passes for each light and handles post-processing effects such as Bloom and HDR. So looking at Renderer, we can see at the high level, the render method is super simple. It does a bit of bookkeeping in case the scene has changed, such as adding or removing an entity since the last call. It then calls pre-render, then executes the render queue, and finally calls post-render. All these methods are implemented by a concrete renderer who knows what to do for each of these commands. So let's have a brief look at the DirectX 12 implementation. There's a lot of boilerplate, but here we set up the bindless texture tables, here we set up all the frames, here we set the render pipeline, and here we implement all the functions which execute the render command types. In terms of describing how an entity should be rendered, the engine has to use shaders because that's what all the low-level APIs expect. However, I was faced with a choice with how to present this to the user. The option I went with was very similar to Unity. The user creates a graph describing how they want an entity to be rendered, the engine then takes that graph and compiles it into an API-specific shader language. I feel this is a nice trade-off between complexity and usability. To try and keep things simple, I describe all the shader code in small files I call chunks and use the Ginger templating engine to substitute user-supplied variables. Finally, for graphics, we have the animation system. An animation defines a series of keyframes, which are just transformations that apply at a given time. It's also possible to define an animation transition, which blends one animation to another over time. Animation layers allow you to stack animations and blend them together, with an optional bone mask. This is useful if, say, you have a run animation and a sword swing animation, but you only want that to apply to the arm bones. The animation controller brings this all together and takes a collection of animations, layers, and a skeleton to apply it to. Internally, it builds a state machine which update executes. I'm quite pleased with the animation system in Iris. It's pretty flexible and has been stable for quite a while. The event system provides an abstraction over user input, such as keyboard press, mouse move, screen touch. There's not a lot to say about this other than a window class will use platform-specific mechanisms and convert them into engine events. You can see here how the macOS window converts native NS events into Iris events. The job system is used for concurrency. When designing an engine, it's tempting to just give each system a thread and call it a day. So graphics runs on a thread, and physics runs on a thread, and AI runs on a thread, and so on and so on. The thing is, is that doesn't really scale. If you have four systems and eight calls, you won't be making the most of the system. For Iris, I went for job-based parallelism. The idea is that you create jobs, which are just functions, and they get executed by any available core. So whilst graphics and physics might get executed in series, they can each make full use of all the cores during their update turn. The jobs API is very simple, and you can either add jobs, which is fire and forget, or wait for jobs, which blocks and waits for all the jobs to finish. There are two implementations of job systems in Iris. 
The first uses stood async and is super simple. Might not be the most efficient, but it will work on any platform. The second implementation uses fibers. A fiber is a lightweight thread of execution. A typical thread is an operating system primitive, and the kernel is responsible for scheduling execution, whereas a fiber is a user line primitive, and it is up to the user to decide when to pause and resume execution. The advantage of fibers is that when it spawns a child job, it can pause and put itself back on the queue, thus freeing up that thread to execute the child jobs. In terms of implementation, Windows supports fibers as a first class feature. Linux and Mac, however, do not, so I had to create my own implementation. Creating fibers involves several steps not supported in C++, such as switching stack and saving and restoring registers. So I had to write a bit of custom assembly to achieve that. The fiber job system is probably one of the most complex parts of the engine and was a minefield of race conditions. You can see here the complexity of wait for jobs. We have to handle the case where we are the first fiber to be called and do some bootstrap shenanigans. And you can see here when we spawn child jobs, we put ourselves back on the queue and suspend our own execution. Iris has basic networking support, but it needs a bit of work. It has a low-level socket implementation for reading and writing bytes. Built on top of that is a simple protocol which supports connecting and handshaking. It also has the concept of channels. You can think of these as boxes in which you shove all your incoming and outgoing packets, and they provide some guarantee about the ordering. For example, we have unreliable unordered, which provides no guarantees, and reliable ordered, which is basically TCP over UDP. As I wanted to do as much from scratch as possible, I did start out writing my own physics engine. I got the basics working with rigid body simulation, collision detection and response, but I just didn't have enough time to build that out and the rest of the engine. So instead I built an abstraction for a physics engine in which I can plug any implementation. At the moment I just have an implementation with bullet, so you can see here how that works for creating rigid bodies, doing raycasts and saving and restoring state. At some point I'd like to try creating a physics implementation just to see how good the abstraction is. The final part of the engine I want to look at is scripting. Again, like elsewhere, I've got an abstraction that is agnostic to any actual scripting language. It's quite expressive as it allows you to set a function, set arguments, call the function and retrieve the results. Whilst this is very flexible, it's a bit cumbersome for the user, so I've also provided a script runner. This takes a script object and allows you to specify the function, arguments and return types, all with a single method call. At the moment I just have support for Lua, so I've implemented the interface with the Lua C API. I've also added interrupt for vector and quaternion, so they can be used as first class citizens in the script. I've built up quite a good set of unit tests for Iris. All the math classes have tests as well as most of the other primitives. Graphics is quite hard to unit test, but we do have tests for the render command building. The jobs tests are some of the most important. Like I said, creating the fiber job system was a nightmare, so it was super useful to be able to create tests which exercise bugs in isolation and debug those. Finally, the script unit test is quite nice. You can see here how the script runner works, but what I really like is the Lua tests. These take snippets of Lua and execute them and verify the output. There's quite a lot of these as they check all the interop. This way I can test that, for example, adding quaternions works when done via a Lua script. The last thing I want to mention, which is all the way back in core, is the start function. This is the first function a user should call. It sets up and registers all the managers and does any other platform specific setup. Then it returns back to a user supplied function where they can safely start using Iris. Here in the Windows start function, we can see it register other DirectX and OpenGL managers and set the default to DirectX. If a user wants to use OpenGL, they can just change this. Well, that was a whirlwind tour of Iris. I deliberately kept it quite high level, focusing more on the architecture and interfaces. If you'd like me to do a deep dive into the actual workings of any part of Iris, just let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching, a link to the source code of Iris is in the description.